Hello, I am Dr. Keith Burke. I am a professor of behavioral sciences in the alcohol and other drug studies program at San Diego City College. The AODS program is a vocational training program or a job training program that's funded by the state of California. We train students who desire to become certified drug and alcohol counselors and sit for the state exam. The AODS program courses cover everything that everyone needs in order to sit for and pass the state certification exam. And those courses are also college credit courses that are transferable for people who have additional academic goals, uh, such as completing your graduate degree or uh, taking preliminary courses in preparation for entering uh, graduate school. So uh, today I am going to talk about solution focused counseling. Drug and alcohol counselors use lots of different counseling techniques in working with clients who have substance use disorders. Everything from basic counseling techniques to more specialized techniques like cognitive behavioral therapy or dialectical behavioral therapy and a wealth of other counseling techniques that are out there. Uh, but of the main and primary counseling techniques that drug and alcohol counselors use in the treatment of substance use and co-occurring disorders, motivational interviewing and solution-focused counseling um, are probably the primary top two. So today in talking about solution-focused counseling, I'll just briefly touch upon the origins of solution-focused counseling. Uh, DeShazer and Berg are primarily the considered the founders or developers of solution-focused counseling, uh, which was originally called solution-focused brief therapy. It actually came out of family counseling techniques. Uh, the basic tenets of solution-focused counseling uh, emerged out of research that was conducted in the 1980s into family systems and effective treatment for families who were in therapy or counseling. Uh, but solution-focused counseling techniques have since been applied in many clinical settings. Uh, as I mentioned, along with motivational interviewing, it is a primary evidence-based practice often used in the treatment of substance use and co-occurring disorders uh, with a wealth of research uh, showing its effectiveness. And one reason why solution-focused counseling has become so prominent in substance use treatment is because of the increasingly short period of time clients are enrolled in treatment. Uh, the days of being in a substance use treatment program for two years are uh, long gone. There may be some residual programs somewhere in the United States in which that still happens, but uh, managed care and other funder requirements, whether public or private health insurance, uh, have really shortened the stays considerably uh, that people are able to actually receive substance use treatment in a medical or healthcare setting. So research indicates that solution-focused counseling has positive treatment outcomes that are basically about the same or at, or at similar rates as other evidence-based counseling practices, uh, but it's much faster. Solution-focused counseling achieves those positive treatment outcomes typically in less time. And we will get into why as we talk about the tenets of solution-focused counseling. So as you can probably guess, solution-focused counseling is primarily focused on the solutions. Visualizing success and resolution. So solution-focused counseling is primarily focused on first visualizing successful problem resolution. So somebody has a problem, if it's a substance use disorder, the use of the substances is causing problems. They continue using in spite of the negative consequences. And so a counselor that is using or utilizing solution-focused counseling is helping the client to visualize, okay, what if the problem were resolved? What if the problem wasn't there anymore? And then start to identify treatment goals to move in that direction. So solution-focused counseling focuses on the solutions, what the person hopes to accomplish or resolve, rather than the problem, the situation, the event, or the obstacle that brought that person into treatment. The 
counselor practicing solution focused counseling is going to be working hard at directing the attention of the client in the sessions towards the present and future solutions and moving focus away from a detailed retelling or the story of the problem. Uh, what I mean by that is that many times clients who presumably have not received training in the tenets of solution-focused counseling uh, come into a counseling session, whether that's an individual or a group or a family session, and will launch into discussing the problem. Here's the problem. This is the problem. This is why the problem is causing so many problems. Problem, 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 problem. And that can potentially take a lot of time. In addition, the focus on the problem, some interesting research coming out of motivational interviewing, that indicates that when people are focused on the problem, that tends to actually decrease motivation to do something about it. Uh, it's not like focusing on the problem makes somebody want to be more motivated to solve the problem. Uh, focusing on the problem instead often makes people feel defeated or depressed or disillusioned or disempowered um, because the problem is the focus. So in solution-focused counseling, we, we need to know enough of the problem to get the gist of it, but then the counselor will move the point of focus away from that. Basically, let's start talking about what we can do about that problem to make it better or to resolve it rather than getting into all the nitty gritty details about the nature of that problem. Now, the client may continue to try to move back to a telling of it. Uh, sometimes in substance use treatment, this is referred to as war stories, uh, giving all the details about all the things that happened you know, back in the past um, in relation to this problem. So the counselor clearly needs to have some kind of empathy and understanding about those concerns. So we're not going to cut them off and say, enough, I don't want to hear any more about your problem. Let's talk about solutions. Uh, but they are going to essentially get to that idea after expressing empathy. Mm -hmm, I understand you know, this has caused a lot of problems in your life and a lot of concerns, and it sounds like you'd really like to do something about this, they're going to move that into a discussion of the solutions. However, there are a couple of exceptions to that. So discussing the past can be useful to identify what did not work previously. Don't do that again. And what did work previously, well, let's do more of that, identify how it worked before. Uh, this is probably one of the most well-known tenets of solution-focused counseling uh, and one of its associations is the what worked in the past, what didn't work in the past. As soon as we figure that out, either do more of what worked previously, because if it worked previously, it will probably work again. And if it didn't work previously, that doesn't mean that it's impossible that it's going to work now, but it's pretty unlikely. And we can end up wasting a lot of time trying things that we ultimately know are not successful. So a brief dip into the past to find out, well, when you've had this problem before, what did you do? Was that helpful? Was that not helpful? In addition to asking targeted questions to identify what worked and what did not work in the past, solution-focused counseling also uses questions to identify exceptions to the problem, meaning that are, have there been times when the problem did not occur or it occurred less? So in the treatment of substance use disorders, uh, this typically is an assessment of previous attempts at sobriety, or recovery or abstinence. So if somebody is coming into treatment uh, with a, an alcohol use disorder that's been really problematic for the last 12 years, a drug and alcohol counselor will ask, well, have there been times that you've been able to put some sobriety together? Or were there times that you stopped drinking or attempted to stop drinking and it was successful to some degree? Yeah, there was one time you know, that, that I was able to put a couple months together. Like, oh, okay, when did that happen? No, that was a couple of years ago. What was going on in your life at the time? How, how were you able to do that? What things were you doing in order to stay sober at the time? You know, well, I was going to some AA meetings. You know, I had a sponsor. I liked that sponsor. But, you know, then my sponsor relapsed and I stopped going to meetings, you know, and I went back to using. So obviously, in this case, if in the past, finding the right sober support meetings and the right sponsor was helpful, well, then that may lend itself to a, a discussion of redoing something like that again, or even times where the problem occurred less. 
so in the case of a co-occurring uh, anxiety disorder, you know, with a substance use disorder, we may ask about times where the person was less anxious. Maybe anxiety was still there, but it wasn't quite at the same paralyzing level that it is now. And we'd want to know about that. Well, what was happening at the time? Why was it less? Were you doing something specific? So the exceptions, um, it's related to what worked, what didn't work. So basically what we're doing in both those cases is we're talking about the past, but we're still solution focused. We want to know about solutions in the past or times in the past that something was working to some degree or another. So questions to get at the exceptions, you know, when were things going well or better? What skills were you using at that time? Uh, what resources did you have access to? What were you doing that was different? And the goal is to identify these exceptions, not to rehash the past failures. Like if the client tries to move into, yeah, you know, I got a couple months clean, but then I relapsed because blah, blah, blah. Right? We're, we're going to gently, with empathy and care and concern, move that discussion off the retelling of the past into what we can do about that. And in identifying the exceptions, we're going to use that information to plan for what we can do to solve or improve the problem now. Identifying previous successes. So solution-focused counseling recognizes that client strengths and previous successes are a really important resource. So if we're going to try and figure out what to do to solve this problem. We want to try and figure out what is the client good at? What strengths do they bring into the forefront? And what did they, have they done previously that was successful? In many cases, the previous successes are a good starting point with a goal of repeating the actions or the behaviors that worked previously and applying that to whatever the current problem or concern is. And so identifying client strengths and previous successes are then included in the treatment planning, either as an aspect of a treatment goal or the treatment goal itself. So like, for example, if a client found that, um, you know, going to meetings and working with a sponsor was successful in the past, you know, but it was, you know, really difficult to get to that particular meeting. Well, then that particular meeting may not actually be the treatment goal, but there might be some aspect of meetings that were helpful. Or maybe the client, you know, went to sober support meetings and found that he had a couple of friends there uh, that he was able to lean on and talk to, and that helped him to remain sober. Uh, but he really hated Alcoholics Anonymous, just didn't like the philosophy. And so, you know, maybe in here, it's not specifically Alcoholics Anonymous, but there may be sober support in general, or finding friends who are also trying to stay sober, which may be appropriate as a treatment goal. The idea is strengths and previous successes are utilized in some way, either as the treatment goal itself, or as an aspect of the goal. So philosophically, uh, sometimes it's called to refer to as the victim versus the power position. So focusing the sessions on solutions and strengths moves the victim, the client out of the victim perspective. So the victim perspective is one in which things are happening to the person. Uh, that it's not their fault. There's nothing they can do about it, right? Bad things happened to me. I was a victim of my circumstances, choices, et cetera. And so by focusing on solutions and strengths, what we're trying to do is move the person into the power position where they are taking charge and making changes to improve the situation. It's a perspective shift, like a, a mental shift. When one feels like a victim, then we tend to act like a victim. Whereas if we are in a, a power position, you know, then we feel more empowered to make changes. Uh, this is similar to, um, I'm not going to talk about it in this lecture, uh, but people who have been in domestic violence or intimate partner violence situations um, in the counseling field and the treatment field, um, there is a move to make sure that we refer to them as domestic violence survivors, not as domestic violence victims, for much the same reason, uh, to provide empowerment and strength. Now, the perhaps the most widely recognized technique of solution-focused counseling is the miracle question. So the miracle question is used to determine an ideal future state of some sort, uh, a future state in which these problems don't exist anymore. 
And the miracle question is used to provide some direction to identifying appropriate treatment goals and solutions. So the miracle question is, if you woke up tomorrow and a miracle had happened so that you no longer had this problem or these problems, what exactly would be different? Now, this can be really helpful if the client is stuck. They're, they're really fixated on uh, you know, what's happened to them. They're stuck in the victim position. You know, we start to ask them questions about, you know, what can you do? Has, has anything ever worked for you before? No, it's always been a failure. You know, what do you think you could do to make the situation different? I have no idea what to do. That's why I'm here in therapy. So we could ask the question this. Let's say the client has come to our substance use treatment facility. Uh, they have a long history of a heroin use disorder, multiple relapses, been in uh, seven outpatient programs and three inpatient programs, struggled with this for the last 12 years, also has PTSD and an anxiety disorder from some traumas they had experienced. And so they're, they're really stuck. I don't know what to do. And so if we say like, okay, well, if you woke up tomorrow and a miracle had happened so that you no longer had this problem, what exactly would be different? If I woke up and a miracle happened, I mean, I don't know. I guess I'd be sober. Okay, great. So let's put that down. So one thing that'd be different would be that you're sober. What else would be different about your life? I don't know. I guess I wouldn't have anxiety any longer. Ah, okay. So like sober, no longer having anxiety. What else? Like specifically, what kinds of things would be different? Visualize yourself there. You woke up tomorrow and a miracle had happened. You no longer have problems. Well, I guess I'd probably have my own apartment and I don't know, I guess maybe I'd have a, a good job with some money. Ah, good. So apartment and job. What else? Um, I don't know. I guess I'd have a dog. Maybe I really want to get a dog, but I haven't been able to do that because I've been in and out of treatment. And so what the counselor is doing is they're identifying these benchmarks, right? These success benchmarks as a, an ideal future state. And then what's going to happen is you take each of those things and we go back to the solution focus. Okay, so in being sober, what are the steps that you can take to move towards the ultimate goal of being sober or sobriety? Well, I can complete this program, you know, I can, you know, get a sponsor, I can go to meetings, you know, great. You know, so so what else what are some things that we can do to move towards the ideal state where you don't have anxiety any longer? You know, well, I guess I could take my medications and you know, I don't know, like somebody was saying in group the other day that deep breathing helps them. And so the idea is that the miracle question gets the conversation moving uh, towards identifying those solutions. So it can be helpful to get them past resistance, doubts, or paralysis, um, and gives us directions to move, or gives us a direction to move towards. All right, so the orientation of solution-focused counseling uh, is moving towards treatment goals, uh, or sorry, is uh, focusing on solutions and then moving towards treatment goals. But I'm gonna stop here for just a second. For those of you who are watching this video as part of a course at San Diego City College that you're receiving credit for, uh, this is the key word or key phrase non sequitur. You will be tested upon conclusion of this video, and one of the questions will ask for the keyword or the key phrase. Now, the keyword or key phrase will not be on the PowerPoint slides, and the student's only going to know the keyword or key phrase if they actually watch the video. So the key phrase for this video is, miracles are wonderful. Again, the key phrase is, miracles are wonderful. All right. Let's get back to our lecture. So after we've started to generate the discussion towards finding solutions, we need to turn those solutions into treatment goals. So the solution-focused counselor is going to assist the client to identify very specific actions or small steps that can be taken towards solving the problems. So specific actions and, and small steps. So if the client's goal is, well, I guess I wouldn't be anxious anymore. That's a great goal. I don't want to be anxious anymore. But there's no specific action tied into that. 
so the, again, the clients typically are not trained in solution focused and other types of counseling techniques. So they're usually going to need some assistance with this. So if the goal is not to feel anxiety anymore, what are some specific things that you can do in order to not feel so anxious? And so through the act of asking questions and collaborating with the client, um, we will get some kind of actions, but they also need to be very small steps. So this is another one of the tenets of solution-focused counseling. Um, and it in some way contributes to some of the research on motivational interviewing too, which is that small steps tend to increase motivation, whereas big, huge goals that are very hard to handle and full of multiple steps that haven't been identified can really be disheartening. You know, so if the goal is not to feel anxiety anymore, you know, well, well how might you do that? Well, I guess, you know, if I had a house and a job and a lot of money and my dog, then I wouldn't feel anxiety anymore. Okay, so let's put that down on your treatment plan. Uh, the goal is get a house, get a job, get a dog, and then you won't feel anxious anymore. All right, get working on this that this week. And uh, let me check in with you next Monday and we'll, we'll see how that's going. All right, so, I mean, there might be some, some long-term goals in there and some actions that can be determined, but they're not small steps. And so what we want are small steps, small things that are easily accomplishable so we can build some kind of momentum. And those are often referred to as achievable goals. So what we wanna do is have goals that they can realistically accomplish, typically between now and the next session. Uh, sometimes you'll see this um, aspect of this in relation to SMART goals, which I'm not gonna talk about in this lecture, but it is something students learn in the AODS program. Uh, you know, where a SMART goal is something that can be accomplished in the next week to four weeks. But even smaller than that is often really helpful to build momentum. So we have something that's realistic that can be accomplished in a short period of time. And this uh, is almost always better than attempting the big change. The idea being that a series of small goals lead to big change. So any kind of big goal that anybody's ever had. Uh, enrolling in the AODS program at San Diego City College, becoming a certified alcohol and drug counselor, uh, gaining a bachelor's degree or an associate's degree. There's many, many, many steps in the process of achieving that larger goal. And that's really the idea here is that a series of small goals will lead ultimately to big change. Whereas trying to accomplish the big goal too fast without really taking into account those small steps can often fail and lead the person to feeling more disheartened and the same problem still there. So the concept here with small goals too is that small goals that are achievable and successful can be replicated in other areas of life. So for example, in a group counseling environment in substance use treatment, simply learning to speak up in group, uh, which may be done at, let's say it's a process group, you know, a, a small goal for somebody who doesn't tend to speak very much in a process group will be that at least once, they once, you know, each group, the person agrees to say something, either they will bring up something that's on their mind or a situation they have, or they'll say something in support of somebody else. Totally appropriate, little tiny goal, just once when you are each week when you're in a process group, you need to speak up. And maybe the counselor will make a platform for the person if, if they haven't spoken up, meaning that they'll call on them. Well, the person that, uh, st that implements this small treatment goal learns how to become more comfortable speaking up. Well, suddenly what will start to happen is they may start speaking up more at home or at work or among friends, et cetera. And so again, in the, one of these, these tenant ideas of solution-focused counseling is set small goals that are achievable and successful that are moving towards the solution. Now, both the ideas for the solution and the specific actions or treatment goals to get there are primarily client initiated or client identified through a series of targeted questions designed to evoke solutions from the client. Um, like motivational interviewing, solution-focused counseling's fundamental principle is that clients know what is best for them and how to effectively get there. Now, I'm not going to talk much about motivational interviewing in this lecture. However, if you are on the YouTube page, there are a number of lectures there on motivational interviewing. And for those who are current students in the AODS program at San Diego City College, you will get lots and lots of training on motivational interviewing. But one of the essential ideas in motivational interviewing is don't tell your clients what to do. Don't give your clients advice. Don't make suggestions for them or come up with their treatment goals. 
because the research is really clear. Uh, when clients are told what to do, they are less motivated to do it than when they come up with their own ideas about what they're willing to do, what they would like to do, what they think would work best for them in their life. So solution-focused counseling uses the same idea. Let's find out from the client what they think the solution might be to this problem. All right, in terms of defining these goals, the goals need to be something that the client can take action on. So a goal has to have an action associated with it. And it needs to be something that can be done today or tomorrow or quickly versus something that I will achieve someday. Goals also need to be framed as something that the client can do, meaning again, an action versus not doing something. So if the treatment goal is I won't drink, okay, that's an admirable treatment goal, but there's no action associated with that. There's a non-action, but the client isn't actually do some, doing something. So what the counselor will do in solution-focused counseling is say, okay, great. So you don't want to do that. What are you going to do instead of doing that? Uh, this isn't necessarily um, associated with solution-focused counseling, but it's, it's worth mentioning here too, that humans typically are very poor at identifying a negative and doing something about that, meaning I won't do something, primarily because the human brain doesn't work that way. So if I tell you, don't think of a kangaroo, don't see an image of a kangaroo, don't see the pouch in the front of the kangaroo or the big long tail, right, or the two big legs, stop thinking of kangaroos. Now, most of the time when I do this in the classroom, the students laugh because everybody is just, I mean, they can't stop thinking about kangaroos because I told them don't think about kangaroos. And the brain doesn't know how to do that unless it's got something else to focus on. So if I said, don't think about kangaroos, I want you to think about a coffee cup instead, stay focused on the coffee cup. Well, the brain can do that. It can you know, work towards pushing the image of the kangaroo aside and instead focusing on a coffee cup. So here, I won't drink. If somebody sets a goal, I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to drink this weekend. I'm not going to drink this weekend. I'm not going to drink tonight. Well, all they're thinking about is drinking, right? And now they have to have some weird metaphysical you know, eraser to try and erase that. So what you want to do instead is frame goals as, okay, well, then what will you do? Um, I'll go to the gym instead. As soon as the person says that, then the image of going to the gym is in their mind and they'll move towards that. All right, and similar to that, goals must be framed in the positive. So I will avoid depression, you know, versus I will look for a job. All right, the other thing about uh, defining achievable treatment goals, the goals need to be something that the client can do at their own initiative. Treatment goals don't work when the goals are set for somebody else. You know, so my goal is that my wife is going to be nicer to me. Uh, it's a great goal, you know, but ultimately, you know, it's, there's not a lot I can do. Even if it's framed, um, I'm going to go home and I'm going to wash the dishes so that my wife won't be mad at me. Well, I can go home and wash the dishes. That's definitely within my power to do that. But ultimately, whether or not my wife is mad with me, mad at me, I have a limited amount of control over that. So typically, when we're coming up with tre treatment goals, we do not endorse or allow treatment goals that are not under the power of the client at their own initiative. Um, and again, goals need to be framed as a single step in a long process. I want to quit drinking. Okay, what can you do today in order to support that? I guess I can go to a meeting. Now, the counselor is also often going to have to help the client change vague general goals into specific observable action items that they can do. So again, I mentioned SMART goals earlier, uh, which is discussed in other classes and other lectures at San Diego City College, uh, but the S in SMART stands for specific. So a specific action. A specific action is one that can be visualized. So if a client tells me, I'm going to go to an AA meeting tonight, and I close my eyes, I can picture that. I know what an AA meeting looks like. I can see my client there at the AA meeting. Got it. That's a specific action. So if a client tells me I'm going to work on being happy tonight, and I close my eyes and I try to picture that, I have no idea what they're doing, right? I mean, there's many, many things that they could do to potentially be happy, but there's no specific action that I can see. 
So when we are writing treatment goals or helping a client identify a treatment goal, that needs to be a specific observable action. And typically we're gonna to have to help them get there and turn it into an action. So uh, this is just a little example of maybe a dialogue, right? Uh, I, you know, wh what would you like to see happen here? You know, the, the, the depression that you're having, do you have any thoughts about a goal or what you'd like to see happen here? Well, I want to feel better. Okay, great. So when you say you want to feel better, what does feel better mean? Well, I mean, I guess I wouldn't feel hung over in the morning. Okay. So if you weren't feeling hung over, what would you feel instead? Well, I'd feel like I'd be able to get out of bed. Uh-huh. And I mean, what would you do when you start to feel better and you get out of bed? Well, I guess I could start running again, which is something I haven't done since high school. Ah, okay. So the goal then is to start running again in the mornings after you get out of bed. And so you see how what we took was a vague goal of, I want to feel better. And through a series of questions, move that into a specific observable action. And ultimately note the client is coming up with this action. So I'm not telling them in order to feel better, you should get out of bed in the morning and go running. I mean, some people might feel like that would be a horrible thing to do, right? But this particular client has come up with this on their own volition of something that they can do. And we just simply help them make it a specific action. So overall, when we're helping clients set goals, the counselor alternates between being in the role of the cheerleader and the coach. So we really want to highlight, you know, good steps. Yeah, that's a great idea, right? And kind of coaching like, okay, so what can you do next? What happened there? You know, what might be a better way to handle this? So highlighting progress, we're trying to build confidence, motivation, and clarify new goals. And again, with the small steps idea, we pay particular attention to any behaviors on the client's part that are contributing towards moving in the direction of the client's goals. Now, going back to what we were talking about earlier, you know, the client may still end up going back to talking about the past. So, you know, perhaps the client was doing great. Uh, they agreed they were going to go running in the morning and, you know, they leave. And we see them at our next session and come in and say, hey, so, you know, how's it going since I saw you last? I know one of the things you said you were going to try to do uh, was run in the morning. Yeah, that didn't happen. You know, like, I just, I don't know. I just, you know, I, I suck. I guess I'm lazy. Like, you know, it always happens. I set this, these goals and it never happens. Like, I always want to run a marathon, but that never happened before because last time I tried to do that, you know, like, I, I pulled my calf muscle and, you know, and they move into the, all the detailed retelling of the problems. Right. And so what we're going to do again is we're going to shift that and we're going to start moving towards solutions, uh, paying attention to anything contributing to moving towards the goals. So I say, OK, so so it sounds like you didn't get up in the morning and run. Uh, but, you know, tell me, how was it getting out of bed in the morning? Well, that was actually a little better this week. Um, you know, I, I mean, I wasn't feeling hungover. I think I'm starting to, to sleep a little better. Hmm, OK, great. What did you do when you got up in the morning? Uh, well, I mean, I didn't go running, you know, but I mean, I, I did go for a walk. I took the dog for a walk. Oh, well, that's interesting. So that's not something you'd usually do in the morning. No, no, man. I'd, I'd like to be in bed forever. In fact, sometimes, I mean, the dog would pee because I didn't get up early enough to take her out of the house. Okay, great. So you didn't run this week, but it sounds like you were able to get out of bed in the morning and you did have a little bit more energy and, and you started out walking. Like, that's awesome. I mean, that's definitely a step in the direction of what you've identified as a possible solution. And so again, you know, cheerleader, coach, highlighting progress, trying to focus on what did work rather than what didn't work. All right, uh, the rating scale. So rating scales are a common clinical technique, not unique to solution-focused counseling, but definitely employed in solution-focused counseling um, as a way to establish perspective, benchmarks, and a discussion about small goals. So the rating scale is the on a scale of one to 10 question. So um, you start the question with on a scale of one to 10 and down there in the footer, you can see some example questions. On a scale of one to 10, how satisfied do you feel today? On a scale of one to 10, how would you rate your depression? On a scale of one to 10, how strong do you feel in your sobriety? On a scale of one to 10, how do you feel about your fitness goals, rate your pain, how motivated are you, et cetera? And what you do is you set the scale. So on a scale of one to 10, one being the worst things have ever been, 
and 10 being all the problems are solved. So on that scale of one to 10, how do you feel about your fitness goals? Like mm, a two. Okay, well, so why do you feel that it was a two? Because I didn't get up and run this week, even though I said I was going to run. Uh huh. Okay, so what makes it a two and not a one? Well, because I did get up and walk the dog. Ah, so it's not the worst it could have been, right? It's not a one, it's a two. So there's definitely room for improvement here. But walking the dog moves you at least from a one to a two. And that's basically how we use the rating scale in solution-focused counseling. So uh, using what are sometimes called scaling questions, what we're trying to do is set small goals. So things like, what could you do to move from a four to a five? Uh, okay, great. You know, so you're at a three right now. Well, what's stopping you from slipping down one point lower? Uh, where on the scale would be good enough? Like 10 would be awesome, right? But where would be good enough with your depression? I mean, if, if, if you were a 10 and your depression was completely eradicated, like, I mean, where would you feel like, like it's okay, okay enough that, you know, you can function and you feel better? Mm, well, I guess a seven. Okay. And what number do you feel like you're at today? Mm, I guess I'm a five. Oh, okay. Awesome. So five is definitely better than one. Uh, so why are you at a five? Like what's happening? Well, because I'm not feeling, you know, I'm taking my meds. I'm not feeling so depressed. Like, okay, well, let's talk about what it would take to get you from a five to a seven. And so you get the idea of how you're using the scale to break these into small steps. Uh, what's the smallest thing you could do today to move slightly forward or up on the scale? That's another great question. All right, and then coping questions. So coping questions in solution-focused counseling are useful when a client is depressed or defeated and not motivated to set goals. So coping questions are questions about how the client is coping or has managed to achieve or maintain their current level of progress um, or, or any recent positive changes or resources. And so, you know, a coping question here at the bottom might be, you know, the client comes in and they're just, they're, they're so depressed and it just, nothing feels like it's working and, you know, their mother's still not talking to them and, you know, the, the kids are still causing trouble and it just feels hopeless and bleak, right? I'm like, okay, yeah, that, that is, that is hard. Um, did the kids get off to school today? Yeah, yeah, you know, they're at school, but I don't know what I'm going to do for the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see how things have been really difficult for you. Yet I'm struck by the fact that you got up this morning and you got the kids off to school before coming here to your counseling session. So how did you do that? And what we're doing is we're really highlighting anything that the client did do to cope with the situation. They may not be where they are, but, but they're here. That's also a very common one that's used. Um, well, you know, in spite of all this trouble, you got here today. You're in session today. You're attending group today. Uh, you know, whatever it is, like, you know, that I really appreciate you coming, you know, while you're, you're in this kind of dark and defeated place. You know, how did you do that? How'd you manage to get here today? You know, well, because, I mean, I knew I had to be there. Otherwise, you know, you were going to give me a hash mark. Okay, great. Well, you know, it sounds like that was motivation enough for you to actually get out of bed and get here on time. That's fantastic. I'm glad you're here. So the idea is that we frame the, even in the midst of all the defeat, it's, it's not necessarily a solution, but it's a strength in that there is some coping resource that the client's able to use. Uh, the goal being is we're reframing this negative outlook. Um, and if you're using a coping question too, genu genuine curiosity and admiration uh, can be really helpful here um, to help reframe the problem. All right, so that takes us to the end of uh, this introductory lesson on solution-focused counseling. So solution-focused counseling, as I mentioned earlier, has been around since the 1980s. Uh, there's definitely a lot more nuances to it. Um, the, the kind of uh, recent um, classic text is More Than Miracles, uh, which is the picture over there on the left. So uh, DeShazer, uh, again, and Berg, two of the founders of Solution Focused Counseling, are two of the authors on that text. Um, so for more interesting um, kind of overviews of some of the details, that's a great resource. The Institute for Solution Focused Therapy, uh, the website is there, solutionfocused.net. 
And then the website Good Therapy has a page on solution-focused brief therapy website there as well. All right, that takes us to the end of the solution-focused counseling lecture. Uh, as always, if you're watching this on YouTube and you have any questions, feel free to use the comments box. And if you are a student in the AODS program at San Diego City College, you presumably have my contact information, my email, and or I will be seeing you later in class. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. And thanks once again for listening. <laughs>